Thanks for the introduction. And uh, <clears throat> I think my presentation, uh, is, again, is about the uh, the concrete test road. And uh, I think a lot of you already have at least heard of the test road, but maybe don't know some of the details. So hopefully my presentation will answer some of those questions. And if not, I can answer those after the presentation. So, <clears throat> so I'm. During my presentation, I'm going to try to cover just a little bit of the background, you know, behind why we're building the concrete test road, how we came up with some of the experiments that were some of these initial experiments for the test road, how we plan on measuring performance, uh, how we plan on managing all of the data that we're collecting from the test road, and then kind of the current status and what we plan on doing going forward. So just a little bit of background from for those that uh for those of, of you that aren't from Florida, our state highway system consists of about 12,000 centerline miles. Uh, that translates to about 45,000 lane miles. And you know, in Florida, a lot of our local governments are also manage some of our pavement. So our state highway system carries about 56% of all the traffic in Florida. And uh, rigid pavements consist of about 3% of our state highway system. And, and you can see where those uh, rigid pavements are on that diagram on the on the map on the right. So all the all the red uh, all the red lines indicate concrete pavements, and you can see they're primarily in more of the urban areas. You see kind of that I-4 corridor. There's a lot of uh, concrete pavements in that area, kind of stretching from maybe Daytona down to through Orlando and into Tampa, then down in Miami, several in Jacksonville, and then over in Pensacola. And then there's a few others kind of spread out. So, uh, you know, why do we need a concrete test road? And I think maybe the maybe the, the main thing is just to, to develop a more competitive pavement industry. And we can do that through uh, providing more detailed rigid pavement test uh, data under Florida conditions with the test road. We can also uh, provide data for local calibration. That's one of the, the major, the major uh, topics we want to address with the test road. Uh, the test road, We'll also provide a testing ground for new and innovative construction, rehabilitation, and maintenance materials and techniques. And uh, also, just to note, there are, there are no other rigid pavement test roads open to real world traffic in the southeastern US. I think a lot of people are probably familiar with Min Road in Minnesota, but obviously there's a lot of differences in the climate and the, and the materials and, uh, and, and weather and, and, and construction practices as well. So. You know, one one last note is that test roads and other accelerated pavement testing facilities have uh, have been proven to be pretty economical, or are actually very economical means of implementing research. I think we've all heard of the the Asho Road test. Obviously, that was a that was a test road. So, you know, we hope to get a lot of information out of uh, the test road that we're building. So this is a map that shows the location of the test road. If you're familiar with Florida, you can see that's kind of, that's Jacksonville there in the corner. The test road is gonna be built on, or it's actually being built on US 301. So that's, a, a, you know, there's several reasons why that route was located there, or that route was chosen. And one is because it's a very significant truck route. There's about 31% trucks that uh, use that roadway. That's a very significant corridor between the Northeast uh, Part of Florida and the in the southwest part of Florida. So you can imagine you're driving down I-95, uh, 301 connects to I-75 and then to the turnpike. So there's a lot of trucks that use that route. Uh, so this is another photo just taken kind of looking at the, the northbound direction. And, and just in that photo, you can see there's three trucks there. So obviously there's a lot of trucks on this roadway. This picture was taken before construction started. But uh, you know, one thing to note here is the northbound traffic is going to be, or the northbound, uh, the existing northbound road is going to stay in place, and we're building the the test road parallel to the existing northbound uh, route, and that will serve so that we can transition traffic between uh, both both sections. So whenever we're we're up there doing any kind of pavement to performance monitoring, we can shift the traffic back over to the existing roadway, and then we'll have full access to the entire test road. Well, our, we're also building a, a way in motion installation and a data building at the south end of the test road. So now I'm going to transition in to talk about a little bit about the, the experiments that we plan on uh, on tackling at the test road. 
So one of the very first things that we did after we, you know, the decision to build a test road was uh, made, it was form a test road committee. And this was something that uh, happened about 10 years ago. The, the uh, test road committee was uh, formed by uh, members from the department and also members from industry. And really the, the objective of the committee was to, to kind of hash out all the different critical research needs and come up with a, what, are, what are some of the, the more important research needs that could be addressed by the test road. And, and one of the main things, and I think probably one of the top priorities is using the test road to calibrate the, you know, perform a local calibration for the uh, pavement ME, the, the AASHTO Mechanistic Empirical uh, Pavement Design Guide. And both looking at the cracking model coefficients and also just making sure that we're designing our concrete uh, appropriately. We don't want to make, or we want to make sure we, we're not overdoing it with concrete thickness. There are, are you know, are, are underdoing it as well. So we want to make sure the thickness is appropriate. Another thing we want to look at there is how how effective are edge drains. If you're familiar with uh, uh, Florida's concrete pavement design, you'll know that uh, edge drains are required on all of our concrete pavements. So one of the things, uh, one of the main things we're going to look at on our test road is how effective are they and uh, are they are always needed. Uh, some other things that we're going to look at too are alternative surface textures. You know, we also require longitudinal diamond grinding on all of our concrete pavements. So we're going to look at some some other surface textures. I think we'll always require some kind of grinding or some kind of texture on our surface, but we're going to look at some different uh, options. We're also going to look at some different base options, and then also, uh, you know, we have a lot of wrap, you know, stockpiled in the state. So looking at uh, using recycled materials, specifically wrap as a concrete aggregate, is also a, a thing that we're going to look at on our test road. So there are three primary uh, experiments, and that's uh, we've kind of divided our test road up into three, three real you know, groups. And so the first 20 test sections are going to be devoted to what we're referring to as our structural experiment or our structural test sections. So here we'll have four different thicknesses. The, they range from six inches to 10 inches. And then we're gonna look at multiple base types. We'll have our, our standard asphalt base, you know, generally for, you know, one of our more common asphalt or concrete designs is a, is a four inch asphalt base over 12 inch stabilized subgrade. But then we're gonna also look at uh, different combinations of two inches of asphalt base and, and different kind of uh, support layers underneath that. Uh, we also uh, are going to look at just a building right on top of the lime rock base, then also using what we generally refer to as our special select soil. That's a or an A3 soil type, which is, you know, an A3 with some specific drainage uh, properties. And then we're also going to be looking at uh, using wrap in some of these mixtures here, and then also fiber in some of the the six inch concrete pavements. So we'll have a couple of sections that are six inches and some of those sections will also be uh, six foot by six foot slabs. Then the second uh, main experiment is our drainage experiment. So we'll, here we'll have, uh, these are 16 test sections. Uh, the thickness ranges from seven to 10 inches. When here we'll have three different base types. And here we're gonna be constructing uh, sections with edge drains and without edge drains and then also with joint sealant and without joint sealant. We'll also be doing some, uh, we'll be instrumenting the uh, the granular layers to track the moisture. And we're also gonna be trying to instrument the edge drains as well to kind of capture how much ed water is actually flowing through the edge drain. And I'll talk a little bit about more of that later in a few later slides here. Then the last 16 uh, test sections are, we refer to as our calibration experiment, our calibration test sections. and the, the main thing here, we're looking at two different concrete thicknesses, uh, seven and 10 inches. Uh, we're looking at two different joint spaces, uh, 13 and 17 feet. And then we're also gonna try to control the set uh, conditions through placement time and then the amount of curing compound that we use. And the, you know, the main thing we're trying to do here is make sure we initiate uh, cracks at different times, uh, depending on the different uh, properties, the, the joint spacing or the curing or the placement time. And then, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, longitudinal diamond grinding is something that's required in all of our concrete pavements. So that's gonna be placed in the travel lane. But then in the passing lane, we're gonna have some of our experimental pavement textures. Uh, we're still gonna place uh, 
the longitudinal diamond grinding on, on some of those sections uh, kind of as a control. And then we're going to also place a longitudinal diamond grinding and transverse grooving texture, which is something we place on our bridge decks. We're going to place that on some text, test sections. And then we're also going to use the, uh, the next generation concrete surface. So we'll take a look at all three of those textures. And uh, the main thing that we're looking at is really a uh, you know, how do they handle drainage and hydroplaning? So hydroplaning is a very important issue here in Florida. So we'll be measuring friction, texture, and also noise as well. And that leads me to kind of the next part of the presentation, and that's how are we going to measure performance over the entire test road? So we're, we've already started some of this process. You know, we, we've started the first phase of construction of the test road, and so what we've done there is a uh, We've uh, established an extensive research level mater uh, material testing and sampling plan, and we're, we're performing this over all 52 different test sections. Uh, the main thing we're trying to do here is capture all the inputs that are required for, for pavement ME and also our, our own design procedure. And we're also doing some uh, additional testing, too, just to make sure that you know, we understand how the you know, the consistency of the test road changes throughout the full two and a half miles. So you can see here we're, and in some of the pictures, we're doing some DCP tests, uh, dynamic cone penetrometer tests that we're, we're looking at uh, moisture samples. Uh, we're even doing some FWD testing on even some of the soil uh, or the, the earth layers. And that's something that, that you don't traditionally do, but it, it is something that gives us an idea of how consistent that each layer is. And then obviously we're you know collecting lots of samples and bringing those back to the lab here to do lots of other tests. So this is a typical test section layout. This is looking down at the you know the test section. You know most test sections are going to be 225 feet. Cores will be taken from either end of the test section, and then we're going to instrument two uh, two slabs in the in the travel lane. And those uh, slabs will be kind of at the north end of the test section. And then those interior slabs will be monitored for performance. So, you know, cracking and smoothness and, and faulting and those kind of things will be monitored in, that, in those interior slabs there. So at least twice a year, we're going to do in-service performance surveys. Uh, and, you know, we're, we plan on doing those, uh, you know, once in the winter and once in the summer. But we're also going to you know be available to do any other testing you know a lot of times uh you know there might be some extreme event or some unique event well it's not that uncommon to have a tropical storm or a hurricane come through and you know maybe drop 20 inches of rain so you know that's happened in the past and i'm sure it'll happen in the future once the test road is built so we'll we'll also try to get out there and make some measurements after those kind of events to see how the you know for one just how the edge drains holding up and you know are they are they uh you know, is water being diverted from the pavement and, and other types of things like that. So once we do these uh, performance surveys, we'll, we'll divert traffic to the existing asphalt roadway there. And then, you know, we think we'll probably spend at least two weeks collecting data, collecting lots of FWD data, falling weight deflectometer data to, to determine the structural capacity of the roadway, how that might be changing and how, how a joint load transfer might be changing then also measure IRI, the, the roughness of the pavement, and, and how cracks are developing and faulting is developing, and then friction and noise and other measurements like that will be performed during this, uh, this period. <clears throat> then I mentioned, uh, you know, we're going to be instrumenting two slabs in all 52 of these test sections. Uh, the primary thing that we're looking at is concrete strain due to both the traffic and the environment. So, you know, changes in temperature and changes in moisture in the concrete slab will will uh, make the concrete slab curl and warp. So those are kind of things we want to measure with these strain gauges. We we also want to capture the concrete temperature. And uh, the drainage sections I mentioned, we want to we want to use sensors, uh, moisture sensors, to try to capture the change in moisture of the granular layers. And then we're also going to uh, instrument the edge drains so that we can measure how much water is actually flowing through the edge drains. We've also uh, our, we've also already established uh, four monitoring wells at the test road and that'll be keep track of the the fluctuation of the water table. And then I think I mentioned earlier we'll have a way in motion at the south end of the test road. 
So if you're not familiar with some of the strain gauges that we'll be using, I have a few pictures here. The, the first one in blue, that the one at the top is a vibrating wire strain gauge. That's, that's used primarily to capture some of that environmental strain. We're also planning on using a combination of fiber optic strain gauges and resistive strain gauges for to measure both dynamic and environmental strain. And then uh, the other the other device there on the on the very right hand side is a thermal couple tree. So that's basically thermal couples uh, on a pole, and we'll we'll mount that into the into the asphalt base, and that'll be a that'll be something we can then measure the temperature throughout the the slab then at different elevations. So we've done a lot of work to figure out exactly where we want to place the the, tra uh, the strain gauges. So one of the things that we did was kind of looked at our past uh, performance, our our past payment condition survey results. And if you can't see the make out what's on the through the chart on the right hand side there, it's basically saying that uh, you know most of the cracks are our most common crack type observed uh, during our payment condition survey is transverse cracks, and primarily those are in the mid slab area. And then that's followed by longitudinal cracks and then and then corner cracks make up a, a smaller portion of the cracks that we find. And then we also performed a series of finite element analysis studies to, to try to confirm where the, those critical locations were. And uh, based on based on those two practices and then also kind of looking at other other literature, some of the other research that we've done in the past and other facilities have done, this is this is the instrumentation layout that we plan on using at the test road. So this is kind of a, a view looking downward on the on the two instrumented slabs. And you can see the blue rectangles rep represent the dynamic strain gauges and the orange ones represent the environmental or static strain gauges. And kind of the, maybe the key takeaway here is that most of those dynamic strain gauges are going to be placed in the kind of the mid slab area, either on the edge or, or in the wheel path. And then the environmental strain gauges are also going to be placed on the edge, but also in corners and in the center. And again, those are to capture strain due to uh, changes in temperature and changes in moisture, curling and warping effect. Uh, so this is a photograph of uh, one of the 52 roadside cabinets that we've already installed at the test road. This is you know, going to be on the side of the road, kind of in the near the location where the slabs are to be instrumented. And, this houses all the instrumentation acquisition equipment. So you can see one of we've already started outfitting some of these cabinets with, with some of the acquisition equipment. You know, that photograph there shows some of the equipment there, but we still have a lot more to put in there. But it kind of gives you an idea of some of the technology that might be involved in collecting all of this data. And so then all of these cabinets are going to be collected by fiber optic cable back to our, our data building that's at the south end of the test road. I mentioned earlier, we've already established a monitoring well. So we placed those at the north end the, and the south end of the test road. And then we also placed two in the within that drainage experiment. And we placed them near the, the monitoring or the, the roadside cabinet so that we can go ahead and connect them directly to the cabinet and we can remote remotely access all of this data from our building here at the state materials office. So that kind of leads me to the next part of my presentation, which is kind of talking about, which we'll talk about how we plan on managing all of this data. So one of the challenges for the test road is that there really is not going to be any full-time staff at the test road. So we're going to be remotely monitoring all of this data from, from our the state materials office. So that's why I mentioned earlier, all the roadside cabinets will be connected to the data building on the south end of the test road by a fiber optic network. And this is a photograph of the building there. It's a <clears throat> it's a 30 foot by 40 foot building. We have a small a room there, a 10 foot by 12 foot uh, room there that's completely devoted to data commu and communication. So that's where all of the all of the fiber optic cables come back to and terminate there. And uh, we've also established an internet connection there. So we're we'll be accessing all of this data from the from the state materials office there here. So we don't have to travel up to the test road to, to, to collect any of this data. Uh, we've also developed a, a database, a, it's a SQL database, and it's based on really the, if you're familiar with the LTPP InfoPave database, we 
tried to format it kind of similar so that uh, you know if you're familiar with that you should be able to navigate through through our database once it's complete so the the, the database is organized in a way that we're kind of collecting all this information that I have listed below basically the uh, you know general information about the test section uh, construction materials things like that and then all the material sampling and testing information will be stored there all the climate and water table data will be stored in this database as well you know all the traffic and instrumentation and all the performance monitoring data will be stored in this database so right now the database is internal but we do have a plan to develop a website and make this data available once uh, once we have more data to share so now i'm kind of really at the last part of my presentation i just want to talk about kind of where we're at and what needs to be done to complete the test road so this is just an overall timeline you know really the test road has been in development at, at some stage or another for more than 10 years with that you know there's a test road feasibility study performed in 2010 and then in 2011 uh, was when the test road committee was formed and then uh, kind of moving forward then in 2016 we had our the first uh, construction phase so we basically have split the construction in two different phases the first phase was really focused mostly on the earthwork and then the data building and the roadside cabinets and then the, the second phase it will be uh, will focus on the the asphalt base and the concrete paving and just a, a word of note here i just got a note yesterday saying that the uh the contract uh, documents or uh, the award documents have been uh, sent out uh, yesterday so hopefully we'll be having a you know the contract b will be be starting really very soon now So this slide really summarizes all the work that's been done to date. Uh, the contract A is complete. That, as I mentioned, that was focused on earthwork up to the stabilized subgrade elevation. We've also, the data building is also complete. All the roadside cabinets are complete. Uh, power is complete. We have power at the test road. And then we've also implemented that research level material uh, testing and sampling plan so that's been done for all the, the layers that have been placed at the test road contract b is really pending award and like i said i just got a note yesterday saying that the uh, the award documents have been sent so hopefully that will be uh, we'll be kicking that off here very shortly and then some other work that's been uh, recently completed uh, we've uh, installed monitoring wells at the site. Uh, we've established an internet connection so we can go ahead and start collecting data uh, during uh, construction. Uh, we've created a database that I mentioned. Uh, we've also done a lot of work on developing instrumentation data acquisition software. So this is something that's very unique and custom for, to what we're doing here. So the software itself was, has taken a, a pretty big effort to, to develop. And we're also in the final stages of evaluating sensors that are going to be placed at the test road. We've also already started pro uh, procuring some of those sensors and some of the data acquisition equipment. So really, I believe this is my last slide, but I just wanted to kind of talk about what we need to do going forward. And again, you know, the contract B that will be uh, starting soon. And that the focus there is the base, the asphalt base and the other base materials and then concrete paving. We'll also be installing the instrumentation during this phase. And then, you know, those layers will also have a, this kind of research level material testing and sampling plan as well. Uh, there's more instrumentation work. We need to install some weather stations prior to the beginning of construction. So we, we already have the weather stations. We just need to get them up there and get them installed. Uh, we need to finalize the remaining sensor evaluation and start that procurement. And then also troubleshoot, uh, we're, we've been involved in this pretty heavily, but uh, troubleshooting the data acquisition equipment. You know, since it's gonna be remote, we wanna make sure that we've kind of handled all, all the issues that we can think of. So we're, we're, you know, we've been doing a lot of troubleshooting in terms of, hey, what happens if we lose power? What happens if something, you know, a sensor dies, those kind of things. So, uh, you know, we're making sure that our software can handle all that and we don't have to continually go up to the test road just to, for, for minor things. Uh, we also need to procure and install the way in motion. That's not part of the construction contract. That's something we're going to do separately. 
and then kind of finalize the, or, and develop the website so that we can share information and data to the public. And then finally, open the test road to traffic. So the, you know, this is a kind of a research level type construction project. So the contract time is a little over two years. But if you kind of think back to all the different changes in payment thickness and, and different types of material that we're using, and then also all the coordination that has to take place between the, the contractor, the CEI, and, and the department in terms of you know, making sure all this testing is being done correctly and also all the instrumentation is placed correctly. There's a there's a lot of coordination that needs to be done. So, you know, the contract time that might be a little bit more than you would expect for a production type job. But again, this is more of a really a research project. So with that, that's the that's the end of my presentation.